So my name's Simon Grummet. I'm a, a medical oncologist from Wolverhampton, which is the slightly unfashionable end of the West Midlands. Um, <laughs> although we do have the best football team. Um, uh, yeah, yes, we do. Um, right, let me, let me see if I can get this started. Brilliant, coming now. So I've been asked to talk about neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy. Now I've done talks about melanoma many times. I treat melanoma as well as some of the tumour types. I treat bowel cancer and kidney cancer as well. However, I've never done a talk quite as terrifying as this one. Because normally I talk to uh, medical students and I talk to junior doctors and I talk to senior doctors and nurses and allied health professionals. But today I'm talking to people who really, really know melanoma and know melanoma far better than I hopefully ever will. Um, I know the science and I know some of the clinical aspects, but, but you know properly about melanoma. So what I'm going to talk about is neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy. Um, and, and this is, I'm going to talk about some of the, the definitions, some of the benefits, some of the evidence, but I'm not going to go into the science in great detail. And I'm going to, not going to do that for two reasons. Firstly, secretly between you and me, I'm not that good at the science, um, which is why I'm a kind of jobbing oncologist as opposed to an academic oncologist. And secondly, I think it's more important to try and get the, the concepts and the ideas across so that you understand the language um, and then you are able to ask your clinicians and your specialists slightly more difficult questions. So, we'll start with adjuvant therapy because this is the easy thing. We've been using adjuvant therapy for years in other tumour sites. And the idea of adjuvant therapy is you have your definitive treatment, so you have your surgery to remove your cancer, be it a melanoma, be it a breast cancer, be it a bowel cancer. And then you have some treatment afterwards, which is called adjuvant treatment. And the idea is to get rid of any residual cancer cells that may be left behind. And it's thought that by giving what is normally a kind of a systemic therapy, something like chemotherapy, it mops up any remaining cancers. And therefore, the aim is very simply to improve your chance of cure. Um, now, for many years in melanoma, we didn't really have a lot to offer in terms of adjuvant therapy. And when I started as a consultant, which was about 13 years ago, um, we used a drug called interferon, or rather we didn't really use a drug called interferon because we didn't think it was very good. And it was very toxic, and there was some data to, to suggest it might give you tiny improvements in your survival. And this, this data here, and you'll see a lot of these. So these are survival curves. And as um, Poulam has already um, suggested, oncologists love these. We get really excited about them. And what they just demonstrate is the percentage of patients who are either still alive who are, or who are still cancer-free. And I warn you, there will be some of these in my presentation, um, and I'll try and explain them. Um, but don't be overwhelmed by them. Just kind of think, oh, he's just an oncologist. It's what he does. But interferon didn't work very well. So... There are lots of drugs that are now available for us to use in the adjuvant setting. And the idea of these drugs is that they will improve your chance of cure after your melanoma has been removed. And I'm not going to go through all the data, and I'm not going to talk about all the drugs. I'm just going to pick two. I'm going to talk a little bit about the trial, a little bit about the data, and then what it might mean to you. Um, so pembrolizumab is a type of immunotherapy. And we hear a lot about immunotherapy. It's Everybody's very excited about it. You hear it at conferences. It's usually plastered all over the front page of, of, the, um, uh, of the Daily Mail when they're not talking about Brexit. Um, and it's, it, it's very exciting. And we've been using immunotherapy for many years in melanoma now. We also use it in kidney cancer. We use it in lung cancer, head and neck cancers. And it's a type of treatment that harnesses your own immune system. It stimulates your own white blood cells by taking the breaks off them that they can then attack the melanoma cells. It doesn't work for everybody, but for those who it does work, it work, can work incredibly well. And this was a trial looking to see if the addition of um, immunotherapy might improve cure rates after surgery. So this trial, um, oh, hang on. Oh, I've done it. I've gone the wrong way, haven't I? on the wrong way again. There we go. Um, so this trial randomised patients who'd had stage 3 disease removed. So these are people who had involved lymph nodes, generally speaking, um, and half of them got 
the, the active treatment, half of them got placebo. And it was ethical to do that because at the time, the standard treatment was nothing. It was observation. And these people were followed up. There was some quite clever stuff around crossover. That's not important right now. The important thing is that half the patients got immunotherapy, half of them didn't. And they followed them up for a long time. Lots of complicated graphs. Um, Poulam's already shown you some of these, but the bottom line here is there's a big difference between the people who got the immunotherapy, the blues on the top line, um, and um, the people who got uh, placebo on the bottom line. More cancers came back in the group who got placebo. Therefore, the suggestion is that immunotherapy either prevents or delays the melanoma coming back. So based on these data, um, these drugs got approved, and these drugs are now offered in the clinic. Um, patients come through, they're discussed in the specialist meeting. If they've got nodal, completely resected disease, but with involved lymph nodes, usually through a sentinel lymph node biopsy, this is one of the treatments that they will be referred to, in my patch, they'll be referred to me to offer them. Little bit of science down here, science warning. Um, there is a marker that we sometimes use called PDL1 in melanoma. In, in lung cancer, it's a very good predictor for who will respond to uh, immunotherapy. But in this study, it didn't seem to make a difference whether you had this marker or not. There was still a benefit from immunotherapy. Hands up who's still following. Hey, look at that. OK. Side effects. Deliberately, there's a lot of data on there that you can't read. There are, of course, side effects. There are always side effects. Uh, immunotherapy, we know, we've heard, we've heard earlier, and I'm sure those of you who have received immunotherapy or may be on immunotherapy are aware, side effects of immunotherapy can be unpredictable. They can be severe. Um, but actually, in this study, they weren't that common. And if you look overall, I think it's about 30% of patients got severe side effects, which means 70% only got very mild side effects. But one of the big challenges with this is that this is a group of people who are very well. Their melanoma has been removed. They are normal. Who's normal? They're normal. But there is the risk of these side effects and these unpredictable side effects that can come on months or years later. And that's something we need to be careful about. And we need to counsel our patients carefully before they go on these treatments about you know, what the long-term effects of this could be. The second study I'm going to talk about is the, is, demonstrates the other type of treatment that we have. So we've talked about immunotherapy, and other immunotherapy drugs are available. Um, if there's anybody from the pharmaceutical industry listening, um, there are various options. That was just one of them. Um, this is looking at targeted therapies. Now, targeted therapies um, are the type of treatment we use when we know that the, your cancer, your melanoma, has got a particular mutation in it. So we can target that. The mutation we look for in melanomas predominantly is something called a BRAF mutation, which you've probably heard of. And if your cancer carries a BRAF mutation, and about 40% of melanomas do, then it's very sensitive to a particular drug combination, a combination of tablets. And again, there are various options available, but the only one that we use in the adjuvant setting is a combination of two drugs called dabrafenib and trametinib. I've had my 10-minute warning. Um, so... This study, similar to the other ones, patients who carried the mutation, again, stage three disease, so these are people with nodal involvement, randomized between tablets or dummy pills. And again, the, the results from this were dramatic. The difference here, a huge amount of daylight between these lines, the risk of your melanoma coming back was halved. So for high-risk patients, this was a huge improvement. Um, and I think probably a little more than we expected to see with this drug combination. But very effective. So this appears to be either delaying or preventing melanomas coming back. They also looked at survival with this. So the first graph was looking at the likelihood of your melanoma coming back. This is looking at whether patients are still alive or not. And out at three years, there is a significant difference between the number of patients um, still alive who received the active treatment and those who received the placebo. So this does appear not just to be delaying the melanoma coming back, but improving the cure rate. And that's really, really important. And again, these were stage three patients, and I'll come back to the importance of that in a minute. 
Uh, there were side effects, the most common side effect with these drugs, particularly in the adjuvant setting, is they can make you feel flu-like. They can give you shivers and chills, um, and that can be pretty unpleasant, actually. And for those of you who've experienced that, can be a really nasty thing, difficult to manage. The problem is you tend to end up in A&E, where everybody assumes you're on chemotherapy, and everybody therefore assumes you've got neutropenic sepsis, and you get filled up with antibiotics before you can say, please phone my oncologist. So it's, it's difficult. We, again, toxicities have to be managed, but this is a treatment that improves cure rates. So in summary, for stage three, completely resected stage three disease, we have now got active treatments, both immunotherapy and, and targeted therapies, that can appear to improve the chance of cure. And this is really important. This is the first time we've have really had this in melanoma. Um, from, an, from a clinician's point of view, it has doubled my workload in melanoma at one fell swoop, um, but it's for good reasons. Um, there are arguments around which drug you should offer to which patient, and, and that's up for um, discussion. Um, but the one thing I would say here that's not been addressed as yet in these trials is what about the high-risk stage 2 patients? So these are patients whose melanoma has not spread to their lymph nodes, but they have a deep or an ulcerated melanoma. We know that these patients are at a higher risk. In fact, they, they are at a higher risk than those who have very, very small amounts of nodal involvement, but they weren't in the trials. And so far, there is no adjuvant therapy for those patients outside of trials, um, and, or not routinely. And, and that's a, an area, I think, that's, that's not yet been looked at properly. Neoadjuvant therapy. Now, the idea of neoadjuvant therapy is instead of waiting for the surgery, you give it up front. Um, and there is data, and, and Poulin presented that data really, really clearly, and it's very exciting. The big advantage of neoadjuvant therapy is that because you give it ahead of the surgery, it might make the surgery easier, it may reduce your likelihood of recurrence afterwards, but also it gives you an idea from a science point of view, you can see what's happening to the disease. You can see if it's responding to the treatment, and you can then potentially look at it down a microscope and see what kind of response there's been. So from the scientist's point of view, it's a very attractive way of treating it. From the patient's point of view, it may well be something that, that improves survival. And there are trials ongoing. I won't go into them because um, they've already been covered in, in more, more detail. Um, one of the concerns that's often been raised about neoadjuvant therapy is what if, A, it doesn't work and the cancer gets worse? What if it makes the patient so ill they can't then have their surgery? And those are genuine concerns, but generally speaking, the, um, the data tends to show that, that these treatments are well tolerated and you don't tend to delay surgery too much. This was one of the studies that was mentioned earlier. Um, it looks like you know, giving combination immunotherapy before your surgery is brilliant in terms of shrinkage of the tumour, um, but it causes a load of toxicities, and they've looked at moderating the doses and tweaking the doses so they're better tolerated. So, in conclusion, I've got three last things to do because I'm running short on time. Adjuvant therapy saves lives, reduces recurrence risks, it is available on the NHS, it is funded, um, and patients travel down that pathway, their surgeons will bring them to the specialist meeting, discuss them with the oncologist, and refer them for adjuvant therapy. Neoadjuvant therapy is still experimental. Um, it looks like in, in the future it's going to be very important and very relevant, but it's still in the domain of trials at the present time. Two last things I, want, I wanted to cover. I was asked, Imogen asked me to cover this following a discussion we had in the bar last night. Because one of the things I do other than melanoma is I'm our trust lead for carcinoma of unknown origin. What do you mean you don't know where my cancers come from? Carcinoma of unknown origin is when a patient presents with secondary cancers, but you don't know where the primary has come from. It is surprisingly common, and it happens commonly with melanoma. So patients may present with secondary melanomas, maybe in their lungs or their liver or somewhere else, and you don't know where the primaries come from. And one of the challenges is people often lose sight of the bigger picture, and they get so focused on chasing down where is the primary that they lose an opportunity to treat the patient 
because I have seen patients who've come to me and they've gone through this tortuous path of lots and lots of investigations to try and find the primary. But by the time you've found the primary, the patient's actually very poorly then and I'm, we may not be able to give them any treatment. So the reason Imogen wanted me to mention this is it's a question we often get asked, you know, how can you not know where my primary is? Well, actually, it's more common than you might think. And as long as we've got a biopsy specimen from somewhere, we'll be able to choose the right treatment for you. Did that make any semblance of sense? Yeah. Okay. Final thing. It's sometimes nice to give something back. So we work in teams. Um, and I couldn't look after all the patients on my own. I have a specialist nurse who supports me, and we have lots of support things like Melanoma Focus, other charities, Melanoma UK, who support patients and, and provide um, really, really essential services and support that we in the NHS, because we're very thinly stretched, just can't do. One of the things that I'm doing, and this is, this is a, a, a complete plug, um, <laughs> is that I'm raising money for Melanoma Focus. Um, what started off as one of those conversations you have at a pub um, ended up in Mia Green to do a series of four triathlons of increasing size um, through the summer. Um, I've done three of them. Um, I, did, I did an Olympic distance one a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the next one, and those are the, the photos from it, in, it was in Whitchurch in Shropshire. The last one I'm doing is, is the, the, called the Outlaw X, which is up near Nottingham, which I'm doing. It, in September, which is a half Ironman. This is a ridiculously long distance um, that I am totally unprepared for. Um, so uh, any support, encouragement, or, or sympathy would be greatly um, thingy. And, and the most impressive thing is that my daughters there, who are, uh, Martha is nine and Florence is 11, they've got so enthused by this that on the day before I did my triathlon, they did a proper triathlon, open water swim, the whole thing. And, they, and I didn't think they'd enjoy it. I thought they were just humouring me. But they've enjoyed it so much that since then they've done another one as well. Um, and, and now the house is full of wetsuits that smell slightly of seaweed and, and, and everything. So, but that's just Melanoma Focus, as many of you will know, an excellent charity. There are lots of very good charities, but it's just my way of giving a little bit back to thank them really for everything that they do.